Hello, my name is Nathan Brummel, and today we take a third look at the life of Theodore Beza, John Calvin's humanist successor. Last time we ended up with a discussion of his time in Paris as a returned graduate who remained jobless to the chagrin of his father. Now in the year 1548, something important happens. God begins to act. God begins to bring this young humanist to conversion. And guess how he does it? Through a trial. So it's 1548, and a few months after publishing the Juvenilia, his juvenile pieces of poetry, which show off his humanistic linguistic gifts, God places him in a bed of sickness. He had a serious sickness, and the young man suffers greatly, and his life is in extreme peril. And there he lays in bed. He's unable to do his ordinary studies, and his biographer says, past and present alike seem to arise and accuse him, and their testimony could not be silenced or refuted. Turn his eyes which way he would, he found confronting him the judgment throne of an offended deity. Baird is describing what happened on Beza's sickbed. On his sickbed, God gave him a conviction of sin. That's what God does when he brings a man to conscious conversion. He does two things. One, he convicts us of our sins and the judgment we deserve. And then he also gives to us faith in Jesus Christ so that we find in Jesus a complete Savior who washes all of our sins away. Now, remember that Beza had learned from Melchior Womar about the doctrine of justification by faith alone. He had heard from his beloved teacher the beauty of this doctrine, but it was not a doctrine he had appropriated. Even if he had thought in an abstract sense, maybe it was correct. He hadn't experienced in his own life the wonder of the forgiveness of sins. So the young man is humbled and he deeply abhors his sinfulness. Looking at his life, he sees the pride that has characterized him, the self-centeredness of his life. And he despaired because of how he had lived his life for the praise of men and the admiration of fellow humanists. He knew that he had loved mammon. He had lived like a dandy. His life had been shallow. And now he realized it had been hollow. And then he was smitten in his conscience by the fact that he had entered into a secret marriage and he realized if he died, he would face the judgment throne of an offended and angry God. And so on his sickbed, by the grace of God, Basic cries out to his maker for forgiveness. And in heaven, God heard him and forgave his sins. And God gave him a new desire. And that new desire was to consecrate his gifts and abilities to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Any objections he had had in the past against taking a stand for truth in the context of Roman Catholic France, now we're gone. Well, in the past, he didn't want to alienate himself from the rich and powerful. That's all gone. He no longer sees any justification for trying to please both God and man. The idol he had set up of the praise of men had now been smashed. He knew it was wrong for him to compromise what he knew to be true for the sake of position, riches, and power, and the reception of those benefices. We are told, never had man greater reason to regard an apparent calamity as a blessing in disguise. And so this young humanist arises from his sickbed, a changed man, transformed by the grace of God. He was a new man in Christ. And what is beautiful is that he didn't postpone action. He was not even fully restored to health when he had already decided he would leave the land of his youth. He needed to. He couldn't freely confess evangelical Christianity. Prior to this time, Calvin had had to flee from his homeland of France. Prior to that, William Farrell had to flee from his homeland in France. 
And so the young man gathers together whatever possessions they could carry away with him. He couldn't even announce his purpose to his friends or relatives. If the news got out, he could be arrested and prosecuted for heresy. So all he did is he took his wife. His wife must have been shocked and amazed, and I hope grateful and amazed at the change that had overcome her husband. Because suddenly he's telling her, we're going to get publicly married. That must have been a great encouragement to her. So all he took along with him as he fled from France was his wife, a few possessions he could carry on his back, and an assumed name, which was the Baud de May. And he left Paris. The young man traveled, guess where, to the city of Geneva. This was also a destination for other French Reformed refugees. So he arrives in a strange country on October 24 of 1548, like Moses, who had chosen not to be an Egyptian prince. Beza had left a country where he had great prospects of preferment, the enjoyment of riches and ease, and he now arrives as a pilgrim. He's a pilgrim on his way to the heavenly city, and he's also a pilgrim in a strange land where he could, however, worship God rightly. And as soon as he arrives in Geneva, I love the fact that he publicly married his wife, Claudine. We're told one of his first acts on reaching Geneva was to procure the public and solemn recognition of his marriage with Claudine Desnas. So what a wonderful situation where now Beza can live publicly as man and wife with his dear Claudine. He arrives in Geneva as a poor man, and sometimes we face financial challenges too. And here we see once again how God provides for his people. But this is a new experience for Beza. He's poor. He'd grown up in a family where there's always plenty of money around, money for his education. He had had the benefices so that he had money for leisure, and now because he had renounced the Roman Catholic Church, he lost his benefices. He lost the financial support of his father and his uncles. And what does the future hold for him? The future is unknown. That's sometimes how we need to step out to in faith. He had a wonderful wife to support him. Apparently, she had quickly or prior to this time embraced the evangelical doctrines as well. God clearly saves him and his wife together. So what is he going to do for work? Well, his first job he got was printing books in Geneva with a man named Jean Crespin. This man was a former friend who had arrived in Geneva at the same time. This man was interested in starting a book publishing business. They both had studied law and had both become reformed. And Crespin had witnessed the burning to death of at least one Protestant martyr in France. He watched a man whose name was Pientri, a goldsmith, get burnt alive for his evangelical convictions in 1540. And this had led Crespin to profess the reformed faith when he saw the witness of this martyr. So Crespin and Beza conceived that they would establish a French printing establishment in Geneva. Now, you and I who know that Beza becomes a theological professor might right away assume that he becomes a minister. But remember, he hadn't been ordained as a priest back in France. And it wasn't clear at this point that he would become a minister of the word. So he takes this job on as a printer, but the enterprise fell through through at that time. Now, a few years later, Jean Crespin did succeed in setting up in business as a printer, and he became one of the great printers. But Bayes arrives in Geneva, and immediately he makes a good impression in the Swiss Confederation. His personal appearance, we are told, was striking. He was a taller guy. He had a nice personality. His countenance was pleasing. He, his background meant that he was refined in his manners and in his interactions with people. He was the kind of guy who was used to being around people who were highly cultured. And therefore, he, he right away began to win friends and in, in Geneva and in Switzerland. 
and his humanistic gifts also made a good impression. We are told that Baze's intellect was of a very high order, being keen, ready, acute, sprightly, and bright, for he had taken pains to cultivate it by the study of Val's letters and particularly of poetry, wherein he excelled both in French and in Latin. It strikes me how this young man is perceived by his contemporaries as being a gifted young intellectual. I think of preachers today like a John Piper who combines poetic ability with effective preaching and with theological writing. You need to think of Beza as someone like that. Beza is a poet and he is going to be a biblical scholar, an effective preacher, as well as an effective theologian. John Calvin also welcomed his younger French compatriot to Geneva with great delight. He remembered this promising lad who was 10 years his junior, who had studied with him under Melchior Womar. And now he saw how Bayes had broken with his past and was willing to seek first the kingdom of God. To someone like Calvin, Beza, during the period when he seemed in some sense privately to embrace evangelical Christianity, but publicly did not take a stand for it, seemed like a Nicodemite. Calvin had had right against Nicodemites, people who, although they held to evangelical convictions, continued to go to the Mass and participate in the Roman Catholic Church in France. Now, since Beza was still recovering from sickness, he did not immediately look for a job. After a few months' stay in Geneva, he was able to visit Melchior Womar at Tübingen in southern Germany. What a reunion that must have been, because they had not met for ten years. Their mutual love had not grown any weaker. But now Beza was not interested in merely studying under Weimar. He, he knew his time to find a job. Now, on his way back to Geneva, he traveled through Lausanne. Ah, and there Pierre Verey met him. Pierre Verey, the, the wonderful, angelic preacher of the Swiss Reformation, recognized in Bayes exactly the man whom he needed to help with his new academy. He had started an academy, a university. We would call it a seminary to train and prepare men for the ministry. And he begged Beza to accept a chair in the seminary. Now, Beza was, was taken back by this. He was surprised. He, he consulted John Calvin. The call was a surprise. He thought, first, I should decline it. The main reason was, he said, I'm not very healthy. Also, he said, you know, I've published this juvenilia, this book on poetry, and I'm kind of embarrassed to become a, a teacher and trainer of pastors when I have that in my background. But Verre wrote to Calvin together they helped to remove any scruples that Beza had. And so Bern then, that kind of oversaw and governed what was happening in Lausanne, extended a formal and quite flattering invitation to this young Frenchman to become a professor at the academy in Lausanne. And Beza felt that he couldn't turn this down. And he needed a job, remember, to provide for his wife. He, however, did ask for a church council to examine his past life and doctrine. He realized he would now become an ordained minister, and he thought that for his good and for the good of the Swiss churches, he ought to be publicly examined to have what we would almost call like a, a ministerial or candidate exam. He wanted a theological exam, a ministerial exam, that would properly evaluate whether he should become a preacher and a professor of theology. And he was quite open with the churches about his poetry and his sorrow about them. And so an exam was held at which he was approved. And so publicly he was recognized as a minister of the word and he begins his work as a professor. Now, in Calvin's life, there would be really two areas or three areas in which he would have great influence. One would be as, I guess, a teacher of the Bible and theology. Another might be his translation of the Psalms into French, his poetic work. And then another would be his work as a preacher in Geneva. Although there's more things he'd be famous for, like 
his simply his support of international uh, Reformed Christianity. Now the young man begins his calling as a professor at the academy in Lausanne. We're now looking at the period of time between 1549 and 1558. Beza began a successful professor, professorship at the academy in Lausanne in 1549 that God would use also to prepare him for leadership of the academy that Calvin would start in Geneva. In fact, many of the students in Lausanne and the professors would also move to Geneva later on and contribute to the growth of that famous academy. We're told this, thus began the course of a brilliant and fruitful professorship extending over a period of nine years from 1549 to 1558. And his previous studies had prepared him for his calling. He had always loved Greek. He, of course, could lecture in Latin as if it was his mother tongue. He was now a professor of Greek. He found great delight in how many young men wanted to learn Greek as they prepared for the ministry of the word. So teaching Greek was a labor of love. This is like the dream of a humanist, be able to teach young men Greek and study it in greater detail. He was glad that he could prepare so many men for the ministry of the word. God used his studies as a humanist and his love of languages to prepare him to be an excellent exegete and preacher of the word. More press has been given to the fact that John Calvin as a humanist and a legal scholar was prepared to be a biblical interpreter and commentator. But we find the same realities happening with Theodore Beza as someone who has learned to read texts carefully, to read poetic texts carefully, and legal texts as well, within their context. He has been prepared by the Lord to be a biblical exegete. Now, apart from the inspiration created by contact with bright minds among his students, he also had great friendships that he developed with many of his fellow reformers in Switzerland. Thankfully, he was able to develop rich friendships. Remember, he had left all of his friends behind in France. Now, God had given him gifts of friendship as well, and so he developed many friendships through correspondence and through face-to-face -face visits so that all the friends that he had lost when he had forsaken his homeland were, were now made up for that. And God gave him new friends like Heinrich or Henry Bullinger, Musculus, and Calvin and, and Pierre Verret, and many more. A year after arriving in Lausanne, Beza wrote a, a very interesting piece, which was a piece of, of uh, sacred tragedy. It's like a play entitled Abraham's Sacrifice. Now, it's kind of interesting that he would have written this, but the drama was written for the use of the students and was performed by them in one of the halls of the ecclesiastical courtroom. Beza describing why he wrote this, he says, I admit that by nature I have always delighted in poetry and I cannot yet repent of it, but much do I regret to have employed the slender gifts with which God has endowed me in this regard, he's being humble, upon things of which the mere recollection at present make me blush. I have therefore given myself to such matters as are more holy, hoping to continue therein hereafter. You see, our reformer felt like Abraham had left the land of his birth, not knowing whither he would go. And so what he does is he takes the story of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac and puts it into French verse. It's poetry. And it had a big impact on his, on his contemporaries. But he not only wrote poetry and uh, something to be performed, he also began to write on theological topics. And one was a treatise on the punishment of heretics, which... I could wish that he hadn't written because, of course, it's an expression of the fact that he's a man of his times. Remember, in the Reformation era, most of the magisterial reformers, as, of course, all the Roman Catholics, thought that it was legitimate to put a terrible heretic to death. And so the subtitle of this treatise is 
concerning the duty of punishing heretics by the civil magistrate, in answer to the medley of Martin Bellius and the sect of the new academics. Now, this was written on the occasion of the execution of the Spanish physician Michael Servetus, whom the authorities in Geneva had burnt at the stake on October 27 of 1553. Remember that another humanist like Melanchthon could write to John Calvin and be grateful for the fact that the Geneva magistrates had stood up for the doctrine of the Trinity and executed such a public heretic like this man. Now, Bayes's view was held by the majority of the uh, educated people in Europe, which was that heretics, you know, were more dangerous actually than just like a murder. I mean, if a murderer killed someone, he just killed their body. But a heretic, through teaching his heresies, destroys men's souls. And therefore, people in that time thought that a person who teaches heresy should be executed. Now, Roman Catholics at Vienne near Lyons had arrested this Michael Servetus for denying the Holy Trinity, and they had planned to execute him, just like they had executed many Reformed believers. But Servetus escaped from the Roman Catholic judges, and so he was condemned as a heretic and absentee and sentenced by the Roman Catholics to death by a slow fire. Now, what happens is that after um, the, the magistrates in Geneva sentenced Servetus to death, Roman Catholics would try to tar and feather John Calvin for this, even though it was the magistrates who did this. Now, the, the craziness of this, of course, is that the Roman Catholics were the ones who had burned so many evangelicals to death. They had burned too many in the streets of Paris. And they killed Reformed believers and Lutheran believers. And yet they thought that they could jump all over John Calvin because of what had happened with Michael Servetus, a Trinitarian heretic in Geneva. Now, Calvin's role in that was, yes, to try to win the, this anti-Trinitarian heretic over to the truth and when the magistrates wanted to sentence him to death by burning, Calvin's role in that was saying, don't do that. Don't burn him to death. If you're going to execute him, do it with a sword and make it quick. As a man of his time, Bayes argued that heretics were to be punished by the civil magistrates. He wrote, now the civil magistrate is the appointed guardian and governor of human society. Talking about rulers, he says, but he cannot conserve religion unless he coerces the pertinacious and factious despisers of religion by the sword. He said that whereas the ministers and elders have the keys to the kingdom, the civil authorities, on the other hand, have the power of the sword. Therefore, he argued that heretics are occasionally to be coerced, even by capital punishment. They didn't make a proper distinction between the Old and the New Testament to see that, whereas in the Old Testament, yes, God did call for the stoning to death, for example, of a great and public sinner, that in the New Covenant, the way in which discipline was exercised was not by the use of the sword or rocks, but by excommunication. Now, during the summer of 1551, Bayes experienced something that all too often hit Europe. He experienced the plague in Lausanne. He was also engaged in many and various activities. He sought the welfare of the Reformed churches, not just in Lausanne, but, out, but in Switzerland and also in France. For example, he played an important role in 1557 in the renewal of an alliance between Bern and Geneva. Remember, Geneva was not so strong militarily and therefore they were threatened by Roman Catholics to the west. Bern had protected them militarily. Now, Bern was a little bit at odds with Geneva about some matters, especially they wanted Geneva to follow their way of, for example, conducting yourself in the church. 
And so they, they were holding back and they, they were acting like they were not willing to renew their alliance with Geneva that ran out in 1556. Now this would have been devastating politically for Geneva, but Bezit interceded at Zurich and with the other Protestant canons and he warned of the danger menacing Geneva if Bern would not protect them from the Roman Catholic House of Savoy. Beza also at this time was training young men for the ministry who afterwards suffered martyrdom in France. For example, one time five students of Beza returned to France where they were immediately betrayed, arrested, and condemned to death by the Roman Catholic leaders. He also strove to help the Waldensians in southern France who had joined the evangelicals for example, through the influence of William Farrell, and were now being persecuted by the Roman Catholics. He also worked on the unification of Protestantism by the reconciliation uh, between people who disagreed on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Calvin and Beza both rejected Zwingli's idea that the elements of bread and wine were merely signs. Both men also denied that the bread and wine were transmuted into the physical flesh of Jesus, as the Roman Catholics taught. Now, Bullerger and Zurich were not happy with Bayes' attempt to bring about reconciliation between the Lutherans and the Reformed. The problem is that the Lutherans taught consubstantiation, that somehow Jesus' literal flesh was with, in, and by the elements at the Lord's Supper. But remember, Calvin and Beza played a mediating role between Zwingli and the Lutherans because Calvin and Beza believed in the real presence of Jesus Christ at the Lord's Supper, even though they, they said it's not a physical presence. But listen to how far Beza would go to obtain agreement with the Lutherans as he expressed his agreement with Calvin concerning the real spiritual presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. He said, we confess that in the Lord's Supper, not only all the benefits of Christ, but also the very substance of the Son of Man. I say that true flesh, which the everlasting word took into perpetual unity of person, in which he was born and suffered for us, rose and ascended into the heavens, and that true blood, which he shed for us, are not merely signified or set forth symbolically, figuratively, or typically, as the memorial of an absent person, that's taken issue with Zwinglianism, but are truly and certainly represented, exhibited, and offered to be applied. They're being added to the thing itself symbols that are by no means bare symbols, but such that, so far as appertains to God's promise and offer, they always have the thing itself truly and certainly conjoined, whether they be set forth to believers or to unbelievers. So there he's talking about the real presence of Christ in the Supper. Beza also played a very important role in lobbying on the side of the French Reformed. He was a Frenchman after all. He lobbied for his fellow Frenchmen who were imprisoned or martyred. Unfortunately, back in Paris, we're told, the Parisian mob never tired of seeing the victims of its hatred. Some of them young women and respectable matrons roasted in the flames. This was a terrible, terrible torture. This is what they would do to, to reform believers in Paris. They would tie the victim to a pole. Sometimes the person would be dropped from a considerable height to just above the ground. They would burn people at the same stakes. Now, in our next session, we're going to talk about a big change in Bayes' life that led him to the place where God wanted him to be. Doesn't God act like that sometimes? He closes one door. And you might wonder, why in the world is he closing the door? Well, the reason why he closes the door here is because he wants to open another door over there. And now the time had come when God in his sovereignty wanted to close the door to Beza having a fruitful ministry at the Academy in Lausanne and wanted to bring him to Geneva, where he had work for him to do.